My daddy taught me men don't marry bad girls. They only date them. I um, left my husband. Uh, I shook my fist in the face of God, and I said to hell with you, God. With oral sex, people are saying, but it's not sex. I mean, President Clinton said, I did not have sex with that woman. He did have sex with that woman. God says, come now, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet shall you be as white as snow. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is David Kyle Foster, and I'm your host for today's program. We are here at the NRB Convention, the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, where broadcasters from all over the world come. In fact, some of the networks that we're on are here, the Alpha Omega Network in Tudor Pitan, and TBN Russia and Christian Television in Russia, as well as the Miracle Channel in Canada, Christian Television Network in Clearwater, as well as the NRB Network and the Cornerstone Television Network. We're so grateful to have so many networks airing our program. So while we were at the convention, I thought I would ask Kay Arthur if she would be a guest on our program, and she said yes. So today we're going to have Kay Arthur. Now you know her as the Bible scholar, but did you know that she had a sexually broken background as well? And so she's here today to tell us what happened to her during her childhood and her young adulthood in developing a promiscuous lifestyle having relationships with married men, and then finally finding the Lord and finding the freedom from the lust that she had been living in all of her life. This is going to be an excellent program, so you'll want to call your friends to listen in. So let's hear now from Kay Arthur. One of the things, although I was raised in the church, that I didn't realize was that as a man or a woman thinks in his heart, so he is or so she is. And so as a young girl going to the movies, now you've got to remember, I'm not a young girl anymore, I'm 75. But going back to the movies, there were restraints on what could be shown. But I had a great imagination. So in my mind, I could take things farther than they went. I would get that hint of suggestion, you know, of something that was going to happen, this romance, this, this um, you know, this encounter. Uh, my granddaddy uh, got Detective Magazine. And in Detective Magazine, they would show, you know, these sketches of these gals and their hands would be over their heads and they'd be tied, you know, and it was just very, very sexual. All these things were going into my heart. They were going into my mind. And uh, Jesus would later say, you know, it's what's in the mind, adultery, uh, immorality, homosexuality, lesbianism, begins in the mind, in the heart. And uh, so I developed a very strong sensual focus. And yet my daddy taught me men don't marry bad girls. They only date them. And because my mother and dad had such an awesome, awesome marriage, I wanted a marriage like that. I wanted, I saw them enjoy one another. I saw them, uh, mother uh, leave the kitchen, dry her hands on her apron, and, and she and daddy would dance around the living room, you know, to the music on the radio. And I heard them say, I love you, I love you. And I saw them kiss and be affectionate. And uh, and I wanted to be part, uh, part of that. So there was a, a pull toward, you know, I want to be married. Uh, I'm going to be a good girl. I'm going to be a virgin when I walk down the aisle. And so technically, when I got married at the age of 20, I was a virgin. But I'll never forget the first time I let one of my standards slip. And this was when I was in, uh, in nurses training. And I went out with this guy, and, and his hand touched my breast. And it felt so good. 
and that, and uh, that it awakened something in me. And of course, I wanted more. So in my dating, it was always stop and don't go any further because you're going to be a virgin when you walk down the aisle. But when you looked at me and you looked at the way I dressed, I dressed to show off my body. You know, I when I went to buy a bathing suit, I took a tape measure. <laughs> and I wanted something that give me the smallest waistline and the biggest bust line. And, and so in a sense, you know, my sexuality was something that in a sense that I flaunted. Um, uh, I remember as a, as a young girl, this is terrible, but just going around the house doing all these exercises because all my friends were wearing bras and I wasn't. And, and we had gym outfits and you could see my little pink t-shirt underneath it and, and that. And I just, you know, it was that strong sensual focus. In my life, there was like this dichotomy this desire to be uh, attractive, sexually attractive, this restraint to be a virgin. But when I walked the aisle, I was a virgin. I had accomplished my goal. But what I didn't realize was that the things, the thoughts permitting my mind to, to focus on sensual things, that that would lead me in that way. As a man or woman thinks in his heart, so he is. Our marriage lasted for six years. My husband was manic depressive, bipolar. Uh, we ended up um, uh, getting a divorce. Um, I went for counseling uh, to two uh, different ministers. And uh, my husband had gone to seminary, and uh, although he was an engineer, he had gone to seminary, and we went for counseling, and neither one of those ministers opened up the Bible. Neither one of them explained to me what marriage was all about. But one of them, one of them, when I finished talking to him, came up to me, and we were in his office, uh, which was in his home, and he came up to me and he put his arms around me and he kissed me on the neck and whispered in my ear, you sure are a good looking gal, Kay. And all of a sudden there arose in me just a, a desire, you know, for this man. And here is a man that I've gone to for counseling. Here is a man that when I have talked to him uh, about, uh, he asked me questions about our, our sexual behavior, you know, our sexual life. And I didn't realize that in that process, he was teaching me things that I didn't know. Um, I um, left my husband. Uh, I shook my fist in the face of God. And I said, to hell with you, God. I'm going to find someone to love me. I wanted to be loved whether I was pretty or ugly, whether I was sick or well, whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood. I wanted someone that would look at me and say, you know what, I love you unconditionally. And I think so many times that we equate love and sex together. And uh, so I moved back. I, when I shook my fist in the face of God, and I just want to say this, Little did I realize that when I said, to hell with you, God, that that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. That Jesus Christ took my hell, he took the wages of my sin, he took the penalty of my sin, and Jesus, who knew no sin, was going to be made sin for me. He was going to be made an immoral woman for me. He was made a homosexual, he was made a lesbian, he was made a thief, he was made, he who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us so that we might have his righteousness. So when I said to hell with you, God, I didn't even know that before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter one, verse three and four and five, that God had said to heaven with you, Kay, and that God had a plan. Pure passion that beats for Christ alone. How many Bibles do you have? 
1, 2, 10, 20. It's the Word of God, and I hope you're reading them. Whether it be 2 or 20, sometimes it's great to have a book that collects the cumulative wisdom from the Bible on a particular subject. Kay Arthur has done just that. In her book, The Truth About Sex, Kay has collected just about every scripture imaginable on the topic of sex and brought them together in a thorough Bible-centered collection about the mind of God on human sexual expression. For that reason, this is possibly the best book ever written outside the Bible on the topic of sex, why God created it, how He ordered it to be expressed, and how He redeems it when it gets broken or damaged. If you get only one book on what the Bible says about sex, this should be the one. Then check your stack of Bibles to see if what she has written isn't true. Kay Arthur is known for her fidelity to the biblical text, and you are going to treasure this contribution to the subject. To get your copy of The Truth About Sex, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. I moved back to this area and where my husband had gone to school. It was the Washington, D.C. Uh, area, Alexander, Arlington, Virginia. And um, I got in touch with the minister. And uh, I ended up, well, before when I went to look for a place, I ended up staying at his house. And I ended up doing everything short of the actual act of intercourse. So really, for the first time in my life, what I had thought, the romance, the intrigue, the sex that goes, that goes with it, was actually acted out. And here I was with a married man and, and doing everything short, uh, you know, the Bible says if you look at a woman to commit adultery with her in your heart, then you're guilty of adultery. It's only happened in the heart. It's open, only happened in the mind. And in the Jewish thinking, the heart and the mind are the same thing. And that's why he says as a person thinks in his heart, in his mind, so he is. And so uh, although I did not actually have the act of sexual intercourse, with that man, I was guilty of committing adultery. And this is what people don't realize today, and, and I don't mean to be too graphic, but the thing is with oral sex, people are saying, but it's not sex. I mean, President Clinton said, I did not have sex with that woman. He did have sex with that woman. And what we have to understand is that God looks at it. Where does it begin? It begins in the heart and in the mind. The heart, the mind, that's the key. That's the absolute key to sexual purity. And, and, and learning how to control that, learning how to control the thoughts. I've written a book called Lord is at Warfare, Teach Me to Stand. And in that book, I tell about what happened to me after I became a Christian and how I, I was set free from the power of sin. I, I felt absolutely clean. I felt like a virgin on the day that I got saved. And yet I, I, I continued to have a battle uh, with my mind. And I would start remembering things that I did before I was saved. Because you see, after that, um, that little tryst with that minister, uh, then I, I made a policy. I will never date a married man. I didn't intend to get in bed with men, but I would find myself, you know, the Bible says that we have sunk down in a pit that we have dug with our own hands. And so what was happening was you, you say no, and uh, no, and then one day you say yes to sin. And we forget that sin will cost you more than you ever intended to pay. It will take you farther than you ever expected to stray, and it will cost you far more than you ever expected to pay. Because sin is addictive. The Bible says whosoever commits sin becomes the slave of sin. I went from one man to another man looking for someone to love me. I had a religion, but I didn't have a relationship. I knew about God. 
you know, I knew a little bit about the Word of God. I knew that God hated divorce. I knew that uh, adultery was a sin. I knew the Ten Commandments. But as I said, I had a religion but not a relationship. So what happened is I went from one man to another man, and each time I went with those men, I would find myself doing things that I knew were wrong. Uh, I had two little boys. Um, I uh, eventually met a man in Washington, D.C. Uh, I didn't know that he was married. Uh, he asked me out. Uh, I really fell in love with Jim, really fell in love with Jim. And then I found out that Jim was married. But the problem was I loved Jim. Now, I was sleeping with Jim. And uh, I, I was sleeping with him, and then I found out he was married, and then I found out his wife was pregnant with her sixth child. And, uh, and eventually, after two years of this affair, and, and I, and I want to say something, and, and I share it because I want people to understand that, um, I, I, I want them to understand that sin is never isolated. It affects others. One day, my son came down the stairs, my oldest son, and saw me on the living room floor with a man. And I didn't know it. And I would never have him see that. But that would have an impact on him later. Later, I would find myself, after I became a Christian, saying to him, I don't know if you ever saw me with another man. And I remember that teenage boy sitting there and nodding his head. And I said, I want you to know, if I had known the Word of God, if I had known Jesus, I never would have divorced your father. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And I'm asking you to forgive me for what I did and what you saw for being immoral, you know. And I knew God had forgiven me, but it had his impact on him. And we have to understand that. Sin is never isolated. We say, oh, it's just between the two of us. It's not just between the two of us. And it affects, it's ruining our society. But let me go back. I had this affair with this married man for two years. And then at the end of those two years, I began to feel guilty. And I thought, I've got to stop this. So I love that man dearly. I loved, I had never loved any man like I loved Jim. And, but I broke off the affair. And, and I decided I was going to be good. But there's a verse that says the good that I wanted to do, I couldn't do. And the evil that I didn't want to do, I did. And then he cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to live, deliver me from this body of death? Because it is a body of death. The Bible says in John 8, whosoever commits sin, and it's like chains around you, whosoever commits sin becomes the slave of sin. But if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Your passion that beats for Christ alone. Your passion. How many Bibles do you have? One, two, ten, twenty? It's the Word of God, and I hope you're reading them. Whether it be two or twenty, sometimes it's great to have a book that collects the cumulative wisdom from the Bible on a particular subject. Kay Arthur has done just that. In her book, The Truth About Sex, Kay has collected just about every scripture imaginable on the topic of sex and brought them together in a thorough Bible-centered collection about the mind of God on human sexual expression. For that reason, this is possibly the best book ever written outside the Bible on the topic of sex, why God created it, how He ordered it to be expressed, and how He redeems it when it gets broken or damaged. If you get only one book on what the Bible says about sex, this should be the one. Then check your stack of Bibles to see if what she has written isn't true. Kay Arthur is known for her fidelity to the biblical text, and you are going to treasure this contribution to the subject. To get your copy of The Truth About Sex, simply go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. On July 16th, 1963, I went to a party on July the 15th. I went to a party, and Christians were there. 
and and in fact they were all Christians and I had run into them and and these were people from uh, my religious days I met one and and he was walking with the Lord and everything but anyway I went to this party and someone looked at me and said why don't you quit telling God what you want and tell him that Jesus Christ is all you need. And I thought, you are so rude to talk like that at a party. Jesus Christ is not all I need. I threw my mink over my shoulder, walked out the house. The next morning I got up, it was a Friday, and I thought, I'm sick. I'm sick and there's no cure for my sickness. And I think, honestly, that that's the way so many people feel that are caught especially in sexual sin. Because deep in your heart, if you're a man sleeping with a man, deep in your heart, you know that this is not normal. You can't have sex the normal way that you have with a woman. Deep in your heart, if you're sleeping with someone else's mate, you know, you know deep in your heart, this is not right. Uh, if you're a woman with another woman, you know deep in your heart, it may be meeting a need or that, but deep in your heart, you know, hey, this is not normal. You have to do it some other way to get your kicks because God designed a man and a woman to fit together. Anatomically, he designed it. That's why every sin that a person does is without his body. But those that commit immorality sin against their own body. Shall I take the members of harlot? Shall I take the members of Christ and join them with the members of a harlot? He says, don't you know the two are one flesh? It's the act of sexual intercourse and the way that God designed a man and a woman that makes them one flesh. So I think that, that, that there is this knowledge deep, deep, deep buried within and, and, and that, it's, that there's something missing, that there's something wrong. And, um, and so that morning when I got up, I, I worked at Johns Hopkins on a research team. I'm a nurse and I called Dr. Cheek from Australia and I said, I mean, he's an Australian living in Baltimore. And I said, I can't come to work, I'm sick. And I thought, I have a sickness that no man can cure. And that is true. And, uh, and, and I thought, there's just no cure. You can't do an operation. You can't take a pill for this. There's no, there's no cure. And that morning, I decided I would take my boys camping. These Christians were going camping. So I'm in the kitchen baking a cake, and, and my oldest son is at day camp, and my younger son's hanging on to me, so hungry for a mother's love. I think that people that are caught up in immorality get so caught up in their own needs that they fail to be the parent that they should be. And the thing that if I had known, you know, I would have handled this, this marriage to my husband that was manic, depressive, bipolar so differently and handled the divorce differently and, 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 and not been so centered on me. I felt like I had to have a man that loved me unconditionally. Well, all of a sudden I turned around on July 16th, I bent down, I looked at Mark, and I said, Mark, honey, mommy's got to be by herself. Will you let me be alone for just a minute? And I want you to know that I wanted to be a wonderful mother. But sin takes you farther than you ever wanted to go. And, uh, and I ran upstairs and I fell down beside the bed and I said, God, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care if I never see another man as long as I live. I don't care if you, par if you paralyze me from my neck down. I don't care what you do to my two boys if you'll just give me peace. And there on my knees that day, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says, come now, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet shall you be as white as snow. And later on, I would find a verse, and it's a quote from Hosea. It's written in Romans, and it says this, and he called her beloved. 
when there was nothing lovely about her. I came to God as this immoral woman on my knees. I said, you can have me. You can do anything you want with me. If you'll give me peace, he gave me the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, and wonder of wonders, when I stood up, I knew that I was new. I, I felt like a virgin. And I mean, I, 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 I just knew that wherever I went, that Jesus Christ was going with me. It's the wonder, the miracle of redemption. And I love the word redemption because redemption carries the idea in, in biblical times of going to a slave market, seeing someone in the slave market for sale, paying the price for them, bringing them off the slave block, unshackling them and setting them free. And that's what salvation is. Whosoever commits sin becomes a slave of sin. Jesus walks into the slave market. He says, I'll buy that person. So the enemy comes in and he says, you don't know the cost. And he says, yes, I do. He says, you don't want to pay the cost. It'll cost you your life. But he buys us. And when he buys us, he sets us free. He sets us free. He brings us off the slave block. He takes those chains of sin and he breaks the power of sin. And he sets us free to be what we should be. You know, it's great to have such a witness from such a woman of God. Kay Arthur has been teaching us the Bible for decades now and doing it brilliantly. But it's been a surprise to us that she had a sexually broken background as well. Such a great Bible teacher, and look where God has brought her. Now you may be sexually broken now. You may be living in promiscuity or homosexuality or suffering the results of child abuse or any number of things. But you know, God wants to do the same with you as he did with Kay Arthur. And if you'll turn your life over to him now, as Kay did, he will do in your life the same kind of miraculous work that he's done for anyone and everyone who's turned to him and given their whole life to him. Turn to him now, give your life to Jesus Christ and let him set you free from your sexual brokenness and heal the wounds. Next week, we're going to listen to the rest of Kay's testimony and she's going to fill in the missing pieces to what has happened in her life. And you can have the same kind of results in your life as well. So tune in next week to Pure Passion. I'm David Kyle Foster. Follow you to where the light is. Guide the steps I'm taking.